can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the homepage and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. Bible says God gives us the power to make wealth that he may establish his covenant. So what is the power to get wealth? Is it the kind of grace and anointing? What exactly is this power that creates wealth? Somehow you've, you've actually answered your question because uh, when it says it is God that gives you the power to make wealth or get wealth or create wealth, he's dealing with an ability and when God gives you an ability, it is in His grace. And when God gives you ability through grace, it is by the Spirit. So it can come through a special grace, because there are different graces, the Bible tells us. And it can come through the anointing of God's Spirit. So all of this is one and the same. A special ability, a special gift, an, an, an enablement, all of this is the same. So it comes through the Word of God, it comes through the Spirit of God. So whichever way it comes to you, it ministers the same thing to you. So that's why I say to you that it is an ability, it is an authority, you see, an enablement of some kind so and that's what grace does for you that's what the anointing does for you so the grace gives you an ability or creates opportunities for you and guides you in a way that causes you to have that ability to perform or it causes the wealth to come to you but even when it comes to you you've got to have an ability to recognize accept and appropriate so that's why i said you actually have answered your question from the options that you gave is it that every time god blesses me with money i lose something else i recently got a refund on my university fees and we have since lost two cars worth that much they both just seized and were written off there are other small things of the same nature that happen in my life. Or is it just coincidence? He said, when God blesses you, on the one hand, you lose something about the same value on the other hand. And you want to know why? Well, um, there are two important things. One will be a self-examination. I'm going to look at that with you. 
and then the other will be um, dealing with the situation yourself first from the perspective of a self-examination because the Bible says for us to examine ourselves it says let a man examine himself so I'd like to read something similar to you from um, the book of Haggai chapter number one just gonna read from verse 3 then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying is it time for you O ye to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts consider your ways ye have sown much and bring in little ye eat but ye have not enough ye drink but ye are not filled with drink ye clothe you but there is none warm and he that in it wages in it wages to put it into a bag with holes thus saith the Lord of hosts consider your ways go up to the mountain and bring wood and build a house and I will take pleasure in it and I'll be glorified to the Lord you looked for much and lo it came to little and when you brought it home I did blow upon it why said the Lord of hosts because of my house that is waste and you run every man unto his own house therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew and the earth is stayed from her fruit you know you read this to just understand uh, a situation in those days with the children of Israel he said you're earning and putting it into a bag with holes this happens to many people you know they can see the blessing of God and God is actually showing them that he is for them so they get blessed but they keep losing and like this gentleman said I or a lady here I get blessed by God and then I lose just as much what is wrong I said the first part of it is from the perspective of self-examination what are you not doing right now for these people who were earning and putting it into a bag with holes getting blessed and losing the blessings God said the reason is my house that is lying waste he said you're concerned about your own things what about the things of the house of God so the first thing you do is take the things of God seriously become a partner with God in his number one job of reaching others don't just be concerned about you and your family you've got to become concerned about the things of God that's very very important so support the work of the Lord now if you study further on this particular chapter um, Haggai chapter 1 where we were reading if you keep reading on to the end of it, you'd find that the, the prophet got the people to reconcile their behavior with God and change their attitude. And they decided they were going to build the work of the Lord. They were going to build the house of God. And so the blessings will flow continually rather than earning and putting it into a bag with holes. Now the second part of it is this. Let's assume this was all right. Let's assume you were doing this right there's another part i want to read to you from the book of malachi malachi chapter 3 from verse 8 will a man rob god yet you have robbed me what do you say wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings ye are cursed with a curse for ye have robbed me even this whole nation bring your other tithes into the storehouse that there may be need in my house and prove me now here with say the lord if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the fields of the Lord of hosts now look at that he said bring you all the tithes and offerings to the house of God and then he says I'll pour you out a blessing so now if we assume that you are handling this part properly you are giving into the work of the Lord you are concerned about the things of God and then be your your part uh, participating like this as you should and yet the devourer is there well there's something you got to do you know at the time of this writing in the book of Malachi the Bible lets us understand that Jesus hadn't come Satan had not been defeated and God had to rebuke the devourer himself. Now the devourer is Satan. And he's behind all the waste. He's called a waster. 
He's behind all the waste and all the destruction and all the losses that we experience. He's behind. He's remotely behind his things. And he hadn't been defeated yet. And God had to be the one to rebuke that devourer. Today, when you fulfill your part, you have the authority to rebuke the devourer. So if you are participating in the things of God and you are you are supporting the work of the Lord, giving into the work of the Lord, giving as you should in your tithes and in your offerings, then you can stand against the devourer yourself. Don't wait for God to say something to the devourer. You are the one to do that. You are the one today. But it will not work as long as you are a lawful captive. Now mark those, those words, a lawful captive. Now, I'll just read you um, a little portion from the New Testament here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. From verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, verse 6, which is very important. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. You see that? Now, that's a principle. That's a principle. It shows that God can take action or the word of God will work on your behalf when your own obedience is fulfilled. You cannot rebuke the devourer when you are in disobedience. See that? You've got to function according to God's word if you're going to function in authority as well. So if the devourer is going to be listening to you, you better be listening to God yourself. So that's what it's all about. In the Rhapsody of October, Pastor Chris mentioned that God is not against medicine. So does that mean God is not against traditional medicine also? Well, God is not against any medicine. He's not against traditional medicine or whatever medicine. If medicine is medicine. Now the problem with some traditional medicines is the connection of the tradition to their phobias, their ancestors or ancestral spirits or some demonic forces or some spiritual forces of some kind. That is the problem where it's a juju priest who has to um, preside over these so-called medicines or they get their formula from some spiritual entity. So that's what the problem is. So understand God is not against medicine. What makes it traditional? I think it's a misnomer. What makes it traditional? Is it traditional because there is a tradition? Or is it traditional because it's got something to do with some traditional gods? So if it's the, the traditional god, then they got a problem. Okay? If they're connecting it, they're connecting it to some spirituality. That's a problem. But um, the word traditional itself is not supposed to give it a negative meaning or connotation. So God is not against any medicine. All right. So remember this. Um, if you're going for what they call traditional medicine, remember you're basing your faith or your expectation on some medicine by some fellow who didn't study nothing and you don't know how they concocted those formula for you. That can be a terrible problem as it's been for some people. You know, anybody can wake up and say, I know something um, and, and start putting things together and say it cures. And people are looking for help, so they go anywhere. So be careful. Um, we're not suggesting in any way that you go to what they call traditional medicines today. Hundredfold harvest from my seed sown. 
Are there step-by-step -step principles to it? Yes, there are step-by-step -step principles in the Word of God. And we have taught, um, uh, we've taught a lot on this subject over a period of time. And I, I would like to say that if you place an order for the, for the materials on, on, on giving and, and, and receiving, uh, they go by several different titles, but they're all on this subject. You'll get them and you'll learn quite a lot. There's so much we've taught on this. On, on this. My father lives in Italy. Before he became born again, he falsified his age so that he could legalize his stay. Now that he's born again, should he go and tell the truth? He may face deportation and lose everything. What should he do? He should go and tell the truth. Now let me tell you something. It doesn't matter for how long a lie is in office. It's still a lie. A lie doesn't change the truth because it's been there a long time. The trouble is, if you, if you found a life on a lie, it's like building a house on sand without a foundation. And so, it doesn't matter. You said he may lose everything. He's still going to lose everything. It's just a matter of time. He's still going to lose everything. There's a lot of people who are living their lives on falsehood. It doesn't matter how long. They're going to lose everything. That's for sure. That's for sure. The Bible says a house that is built on falsehood will crumble. And same thing with the life. Your life is like a house. You're building a structure. Your life is a structure. You're building it on a, a foundation, and, and that foundation is determined by whether or not it's been God's word. He said anyone who founds his life on God's word is like one who has founded his life on a rock. And anybody who does the opposite has founded his life on sand. And it says when trouble comes, when problems come, like the flood, like the storm, Jesus said in that parable, he said there was a great fall. He says, great shall be the fall of that house. That means it's going to be a great fall, just a matter of time. So tell the truth now. And... Um, whether or not you're deported doesn't mean anything. You, the, the reason you're telling the truth is not about trying to convince somebody. It's, it's, it's your character. It's who you are. So you tell the truth because now this is your life. And you don't care what you think about it. If you're afraid to tell the truth because of this, that means you'll lie even about your salvation. You'll be afraid to tell the truth when persecution comes. I believe that the Holy Spirit will guide us to provide answers to them today. And the first one is from Priscilla from the United Kingdom. Hi, Pastor. I am scared about telling my friends about Jesus. I used to do so when I was in primary school, but now I don't because I've entered secondary school and I'm scared that people will laugh at me. How should I conquer my fear? Firstly, you have conquered your fear already because you're a child of God. And the Holy Spirit who lives in us gives us power and authority over fear. But I want to read some scriptures to you and then I'll talk to you again about the Holy Spirit. The first scripture I'll read is from Romans chapter 1. And verse 16. The words of Paul the Apostle, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. That means it's God's only power to save human beings. See, so Paul said he wasn't ashamed of the gospel. You must not be ashamed of the gospel. Now, if you are ashamed of the gospel, hear the words of Jesus. St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, from verse 36. 
For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Did you hear that last part? The last verse, verse 38. It says, if you are ashamed of him in this world, he will be ashamed of you when he comes. You don't want Jesus to be ashamed of you. Never be ashamed of him. Now, I said, I'll tell you about the Holy Spirit. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive the power to bear witness of Jesus Christ. And you will not be ashamed of his words. So if you haven't received the Holy Spirit, this is the time to receive the Holy Spirit. He will enable you and he will give you the boldness. If you've already received the Holy Spirit, then speak in tongues often. If you speak in tongues often, the Bible says the one who speaks in tongues, in an unknown tongue, he says, edifies himself, builds himself, charges himself, emboldens himself. So that's what you have to do. And you discover that before you think of being shy or timid, the Holy Spirit will give you that boldness and you speak for him. Because the Bible says that this Holy Spirit that we have received is not a spirit of fear or of timidity or cowardice. It is he's a spirit of love, of power, and of a sound mind. You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. redemption because Paul wants to that we have been redeemed yet sir you say we have not been redeemed but are a product of the redemption now the 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 trouble with with this is that um, there's so much for me to say for you to actually understand the the communication that I gave to you regarding the redemption now when you study the Bible particularly New Testament you got several words uh, redeem redeemed redemption okay and um, the or redeeming now the several words in the Greek from where you get all of this lutron lutrosis uh, apolytrosis um, uh, uh, you have um, agorazo exagorazo all of these words are used in different ways to communicate redemption in different lives the point is when you study the scriptures you have to understand what is the doctrine 
of redemption. And then where is the word redemption or redeemed, uh, the several synonyms that I've used, uh, how are they applied? How are they used? For example, when the Bible says redeeming the time, what's it talking about? The redemption of our body, what's it talking about? You see, so these are a play of words. So you have to understand it in depth. The point is, I was dealing with the doctrine of redemption. Where we are said to have been bought, um, uh, bought back from sin. That's redemption from sin. And that's what I was dealing with. There's a doctrine about redemption from sin. And I'm talking about how that you have to understand the, the general use of the word redemption as per salvation. And then the redemption as though um, used with the light of the Old Testament where a slave was bought and freed. Now, in that light of the doctrine of redemption, where a slave was bought and set free, that's what I'm talking about. No, we were not bought like that and set free. So that's not the point. You see it? So you have to understand the several usage of the word redeem, redemption, and so on and so forth. And what actually they apply to. You know, English um, is limited in several ways. And you can use one word to express so many different things. So it depends on the thoughts that you're trying to express. And that's what I was dealing with. So you have to understand the Pauline revelation to be able to get exactly what I was talking about. being born again or does it have to be another time yes you can receive the Holy Spirit at the point of being born again in fact um, two major places I can show you from the scripture the first one is Acts chapter 2 where the disciples of Jesus Christ received the Holy Spirit for the first time remember before the Holy Spirit came no one could be born again which means before the day of Pentecost the disciples were actually not born again because without the Holy Spirit, they couldn't have been born again. Though they believed, they were waiting for the Holy Spirit to come and enable them in that way. So when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, they received Him. So it was then that they were born again and also filled with the Holy Spirit. So that's the account you have in the book of Acts chapter 2. When you study from verse 1 and read down all to verse 4. Now, another example is in Acts chapter 10. This time I'll read it to you. It concerns a man named Cornelius, a Roman centurion, who had sent, uh, had been instructed by an angel to send for Peter the Apostle to bring words to him. So I'm going to read to you from verse 34, when Peter came to his house. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Then he began the message. And as he went on preaching, the Bible tells us from verse 44, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Wow. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water, that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry seven days. See, so they heard the word. In fact, Peter hadn't even stopped preaching when the Holy Ghost came on them. So at the moment they believed, they were ready to receive the Holy Spirit. So it is possible. You don't have to wait another time. You can receive the Holy Spirit at the point of believing to receive Christ for salvation. I was 40 days old. Now, do I still need to be baptized a second time since I am now an adult? Well, 
Baptism is based on our faith. When we believe, we are baptized upon our believing. And that's why infant baptism is a bit questionable because that infant didn't know nothing. See, the Bible gives us the instruction for baptism on the basis of our belief. We believe that we died in Christ Jesus. That when he was buried, we were buried. In that when he was raised from the dead, we were raised from the dead. And that's what this baptism is all about. Water baptism. So when we are dipped into the water, it is our identification with his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So if you are baptized as a baby, it really wouldn't make sense to you. The question you should be asking is, what did that baptism mean to you? What was it? What was the significance of your baptism? Now, it may have been that your family believed in Jesus. It may have been that your parents believed in Jesus. And upon their faith, they got you baptized. If that's the case, they would have explained to you why you were baptized. And if you believe it, it's okay. You don't have to be baptized a second time. Except you want to, and there's nothing wrong in being baptized again. There's nothing wrong with that. But if it was based on the faith of your family that got you baptized in the first place, that is a possibility. That is a possibility. So maybe you should be asking, why did they baptize you? But now you've grown up, and um, if it disturbs you, go and get baptized. Now you may say, there are, there are others who may be listening and they wonder oh really if a, if a child has been baptized as a child because the parents believe does it mean that that baptism is okay well in Acts chapter 10 the Bible tells us something in the house of Cornelius the Roman centurion when P Peter the apostle came there to preach the Bible says as he spoke the Holy Ghost fell on all them that heard the word and then when he found out that the Holy Spirit had been given to them he commanded them to be baptized. And the Bible says the whole house was baptized. Now it doesn't give us the details of the age range of those that were in the house for a reason. To let us know that could happen to everybody in the house because everybody believed. And the Holy Ghost came on everyone. So that's important. Can a child receive the Holy Ghost? Emphatically, yes. I've seen that happen. And so if they all believed and there were young people inside the house, there were children inside the house, Oh yes, they would have been baptized. He says, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And this was what happened to Cornelius the Roman centurion. So that could have been your case. And you can find out. But if you have to be finding out, it means you weren't given the significance of that baptism while you were growing up. So that's why I would say you better get baptized. Because you ought to have known this all the time you were growing up. They would have taught you. They would have told you you were baptized. And they would have told you why they baptized you. But if they did, and maybe some other persons are questioning you on this, then give them the scripture. ...with someone you want to win for Christ. Jesus was a, a master soul winner. And I believe if we look at his examples and follow those examples, we can be great soul winners as well. If you study in St. John's Gospel, chapter number 4, Jesus encounters a woman at the well of Samaria. And uh, what did he do? He engaged her in a conversation. And what kind of conversation? She was coming to fetch water. Jesus had a word of knowledge. He knew what kind of a woman she was. But he started out the conversation by talking about something that was of interest to her. The water. So Jesus got her attention and said, Woman, give me water to drink. And there was where Jesus started and eventually won her heart and she preached and talked to others about Jesus that was a very beautiful experience another one is in St. Matthew's gospel chapter number four when you read from verse 18 the tells us about uh, uh, Simon Peter and Andrew his brother and those who were fishermen and Jesus came he met them there and said um, 
follow me and I'll make you fishes of men. Jesus always knew how to engage others in a conversation on a subject that was of interest to them. So that's what you do. You, you, you look at what they're interested in and get to talk to them about that. Because your question is, what is the best way to start a conversation with someone you want to win for Christ? Look at what he's interested in. He may be reading a newspaper or something. Look at what he's interested in. And ask a question or make a comment and get his attention. Begin with what that, uh, that man or woman is interested in. Begin with their own area of interest. And you will get their positive attention. And don't forget when you, when you start out with something that is of interest to them, speak positively and not negatively. Don't start out and condemn what's on their mind or what they're doing. Start out and speak from the positive side of whatever it is. There is a positive side. Maybe it's a question you just want to ask. Maybe you just want them to explain something and they'll be glad to explain to you. And be a listening ear. And if you're a listening ear, they will also give you the attention. So that's the way to go on. Michael is from Nigeria. Good day, Pastor. I have two questions to ask. As Christians, what do we do when we preach the gospel to a person that is a Muslim or an idol worshiper and he tries to or gets violent with you because of the differences in beliefs? Secondly, I wanted to know what to do when I preach to people and they say they're born again and I know they're saying it so I can get off their face and not disturb them. Well, a wise approach to evangelical uh, efforts is very, very important. I'm going to read to you something from the Bible, uh, maybe two portions of the Bible to show you how these things are done. The Bible tells us in James chapter 1 and verse 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and operate it not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavered is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. He's saying, you can ask God for wisdom and he'll grant you your heart's desire. Wisdom is vital in our approach to evangelism. So we need. We've got to look at the circumstances, uh, recognize the differences among people and individuals, and know how to deal with them. In Acts, book of Acts chapter 17, from verse 22, the Bible talks to us about uh, Paul and how he encountered different kinds of people, religious people with several different positions. He met them at Mars Hill, and here's what happened. From verse 22, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld the devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you. And then went on to preach from there. He didn't accuse them of being stupid, of being uh, 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 foolish. He didn't call them idol worshippers and so on and so forth. Even though they worshipped all kinds of things. But then he said, I noticed that you have an inscription for the unknown God. Because they thought to themselves... We have many different gods. Just in case we didn't recognize a particular one. This one represents that God that we don't know. And Paul took off from there. See, from their unknown. He began to bring them the revelation of God. I'll show you another situation where he functioned in so much wisdom. Book of Acts, chapter 26. 
And I'm reading to you from verse 24. Here he was making his defense before Festus, the governor, and Agrippa, the king. From verse 24, And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. I like that. Even at that situation, he presented himself so respectfully to Festus the governor, who said he was mad. He said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. He maintained his composure. Now in verse 26, he says, For the king knoweth it of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. Then he directly addressed the king. He said, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. He put the words in the king's mouth. And listen to the king's response. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Now how did Paul respond? And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up, and the governor, and Bernice, and they that sat with them, and when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. They found Paul to be of an excellent spirit. They had thought to let him go, except that he had appealed to Caesar. Wise communication. So, if you learn to approach those you want to talk to about Jesus with wisdom, you are most likely to communicate excellently the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember, our message is good news. Our message is intended to win. Our message is not uh, a message to condemn even those that are uh, idol worshippers or of the various religions in the world. So you're not going to talk to them against their religion. You're only presenting to them that which they have not known. So when you look at it from that perspective, without condemning what they already think they have, they're more, more likely or more uh, likely to accept your message than to uh, turn it down and become violent. Of course, I know that there are unreasonable men and women around the world that may be um, thoughtlessly wicked. But then, it will minimize the impact. So that's the point. This is from Cyprus. And Sad is asking, is it compulsory for all Christians to win souls one-on-one? -on -one? What if I partner with the work of the ministry only and don't win souls personally? Would that be fine with God? <laughs> um, firstly, the Bible didn't particularly say anything about one-on-one. -on -one. But you will win souls if you live for Christ. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father that's in heaven. If you live your life before men at work, um, at home, in your neighborhood, everywhere you go, your light will shine. You will speak as a Christian. Your language will be from the kingdom. So, there's no way that you will not communicate the light of God except you're ashamed of Christ. If you're not ashamed of Him, they will ask you sooner or later why you act the way you do, why you believe the things you believe, and why you talk the way you do. 
and that will be an opportunity to explain the gospel to them. So the Lord will definitely create for you opportunities to minister to individuals the gospel of Christ. It will surely happen. So um, you, can, you can expect that. So when you say, is it compulsory for a Christian to win souls? Yes, you must win souls. Your life will win souls if you live according to the gospel. And what the word tells us is that we should be ready to give anyone the reason for our believing, for our faith. So he will definitely create for you such opportunities. The salvation if he went back to his old life after he got born again. No, you don't lose your salvation. The only reason, the only way anyone can lose his salvation is a total rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you backslid because you were ignorant, because you were a babe in Christ, you don't lose your salvation. The Holy Spirit just continues to seek opportunities to bring you back to the Lord. So you don't really lose your salvation. But you just live without all of the blessings of God, and that's, that, that's, uh, that's sad. But if you die in that condition of a backslidden state, then you gave up your salvation. And too bad. So um, you don't lose your salvation because you went back to your old life. No. The Lord continues to reach out to you. And that's why other Christians keep following you up and keep trying to go for you, to try to bring you back to the fold. But if you continue to reject then um, if you die without coming back, of course, you got trouble. You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now.